One of the key concepts of uh, the Buddhist religion is the idea of restlessness and the idea that restlessness is the main problem with mankind. The main problem that people have, according to Buddhists, is restlessness. Now there's a lot of truth to this as we, we watch Western society frantically search for the good life or what we've been told the good life ought to be. So Buddhism offers the restless soul a religion where the antidote to the stresses and the constant yearnings of life are replaced with the nothingness of Buddhist contemplation and self-denial. Now that's a mouthful, let me kind of explain that. In other words, the Buddhist monk or the Buddhist follower empties his soul of every desire, every connection to this world in an effort to feel nothing, in an effort to want nothing until he or she is completely absorbed into the greater consciousness. There's a kind of a thumbnail description of the Buddhist religion, what the Buddhist is searching to do. The Buddhist wants to just unplug everything that the world has plugged into him and feel nothing and want nothing from this world so that that restless feeling finally dissipates. Sometimes Buddhists compare the experience of their religious life to a single drop of water which is emptied into the ocean. So the individual is like a drop of water and they're dropped into the ocean and become part of the ocean. That's the idea of eventually being absorbed into nothingness. Now, you have to understand the history of Buddhism. For a nation that may suffer poverty and oppression, the Buddhist religion is actually, you know, has a certain appeal. I mean, this has been true in countries like China and Vietnam and Indonesia and other Eastern peoples who have experienced unfulfilled desires for peace or for freedom or wealth for a long time. If you live in a country that's been oppressed for a long time, then this religion that promises release from wanting something that you can't have by rejecting a cruel and hard world, you know, that might be very appealing. This world is cruel, this world is hard, I, I can't find the things that I want, things that a normal human being would want, so how do I deal with it? Well, I just unplug from it. It can't hurt me anymore. I just won't want anything anymore. So you see there are, there are Buddhists in the United States, but there are not many Buddhists in the United States because here the American dream is, well, it's still possible. And many of our desires can actually be fulfilled. Our problem here in the United States is not you know, wanting to disconnect from the world. That's not what we want. Our desire rarely follows the Buddhist ideology of wanting nothing. On the contrary, our main desire is to have it all. We're completely the opposite of Buddhists. They want nothing. They want to separate themselves from the world totally. They want to feel nothing, want nothing, be possessed by nothing. But here in America, it's the opposite. We want everything, we want it all. We want to have everything. Every commercial on TV is telling us, you can have it all. And so those who live in America believe that we have achieved our true goal in life when we have everything, not when we have nothing. Now by having it all, I mean there's a certain list of possessions we feel that we need to have in order to have reached true success and happiness in life. And not in any particular order here, but that list goes something like this. 
um, a vehicle or a, you know, a car that we're kind of proud of. You know, we like, you, know, you turn off the car, beep, beep, you turn it off and then you walk away and you look back at it a little bit and go, yeah, that's my ride. And you get up in the morning and go, beep, beep, yo, oh yeah, that's my ride. So we want a nice vehicle, we want our own home, not just a nice home, we want to own our home. You know, we, that's another part of the American dream. Education for our children, absolutely, and the best education. We, you know, we move around to find the best school district. I didn't say anything wrong with that, I'm just saying it's what we want. Number four, financial independence at retirement. We want that, that's part of the American dream. And then we also want good looks and a healthy body. That's what, you know, if you have those five things, you, know, you, you pretty much got it all if you're an American citizen. Now much of our restlessness and planning and a great portion of our physical and emotional energy goes into acquiring and maintaining those five things. But you know what? There is a strange thing that happens when we finally have it all. Do you know what it is? Well, once we have the health and the vehicle and the house and the money for the kids' education and you know, some retirement nest egg or something, we realize that the old restlessness has not gone away. Even when we have it all. So what do we do? We create a new list of things that we require to really have it all. So to the first five, normally we add, well, more vehicles. <laughs> if one car is good, two is better. Maybe add a boat, some other thing that we can ride around on bumpy land, you know? And then to that, perhaps, you know, I've got a nice house, but how about a bigger house? You know, if 2,000 square feet is good, 3,000 ought to be better. That much happy, you know, maybe I'll have more happiness if I add another 1,000 square feet. And maybe not just education for the kids, but advantages for the kids. Not this that they get a, an education, but I send them to a school that'll give them an advantage over the other kids. Yeah, that's what I want. And not just retirement income, but wealth building income. I want to leave a legacy. I want to be able in my retirement to say to the world, I don't need you. And then finally, once we have all that, we don't want just health, we want to look younger. Yeah, if being healthy is good, imagine I'm 58 and I look 42. Now that's really good. If I can get that, yeah, I'll really have it all. I, Listen, are you noticing that there's a little pattern evolving here? Are you noticing that a lot of times once we have it all, we realize that there's always a little, a little bit more that we might need to really have it all? You know, like the ranchers in Oklahoma used to say, I don't need a lot of land, I just need the acreage next to mine. And of course Solomon says it in another way. In Proverbs 27, 20, he says, the eyes of man are never satisfied. The eyes of man are never satisfied. You know, some people stay in this rat race until they die. They accumulate a lot of stuff, but they never have it all. And some people become Buddhists thinking that chasing nothingness instead of everythingness will calm their restless hearts. And then some discover that it is possible to have it all if they search for those things that are truly available and truly satisfying when you finally get them. You see, God offers to His children 
a series of blessings that are available and satisfying once you get them. You know what I'm saying? In other words, not just having it all, but having the right all. Because when you have the right all, then you're satisfied. Then that restlessness goes away. Now the beautiful thing about this is that a person, as I say, can have it all. In other words, it's possible to say, I have it all and really have everything made available that God provides for you. So the desire to have it all is not a bad thing if what you desire are the things that are made available to you by God. Wanting it all is destructive when the all that we want is either sinful in nature or simply material in nature. Chasing immoral pleasures or physical things cannot satisfy or bring peace nor do they calm our desire and our restlessness. But when we seek and find the things that God has designed for our pleasure, we experience the peace and the joy that comes from truly having it all. Okay, so knowing and possessing the things that God made available for us, this is the key to the type of happiness that I'm talking about. And you know what? The Bible describes three things that we need to seek after in order to be satisfied. Finding these three will mean that we truly, truly have it all. So for the rest of my lesson, let's talk about the things that God gives us so that we in our own hearts can know that we we have it all. First of all, in order to have it all, it means to find joy in your work. If you want to have it all, the first thing you need to search for is joy in your work. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, let me read that for you. It says, I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all of his labor. And here's the key, he says, it is a gift from God. You know, Solomon says that the ability to be satisfied with your work, in other words, to enjoy what you do, the enjoyment you experience from that is an actual gift that God gives you. So many people, you know, they hate their work or they only see their work as a means to an end. In other words, I work in order to make money so that I can buy the car and the house and the stuff that, that will make me feel better. Those people are missing the point. The satisfaction is supposed to come from your work not from what your work pays for. The Bible says that this work satisfaction is one of the things worth striving for. And when you've got that, you do have it all as far as work is concerned. I mean, the gift is not how much your job pays you. The gift is not how much you can buy because of your job. The gift is how much satisfaction the work actually gives you. That's the gift. And God is the one who gives us that gift. You know, people go from job to job to job to job looking for that satisfaction and many times they don't find it. And they don't realize that God is the one that gives you the, the ability to enjoy what you have. How many people have so much stuff, so much money, so much opportunity, and yet they're never satisfied? Why? Because they're missing the ability to appreciate what they actually have. And they think, if I just get more of it, it'll make me feel satisfied. And it's an unending, non-satisfying exercise. What a wonderful gift it is. When we receive the gift of satisfaction that God gives you, you enjoy the day, you enjoy the moment, you enjoy the sunrise, you enjoy your Cheerios. You know what I'm saying? 
God gives you the ability to feel satisfied in what you are doing no matter what it is. If you have that gift, you have a big portion in having it all. Having it all also means finding a good spouse. Again, Solomon says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains a favor from the Lord. Proverbs 18 verse 22. Now when Proverbs were written in those days, only the men you know, took wives. And so it's written from a male or a patriarchal society. You know, a man is the one who finds the wife. But the reverse is equally true. A woman who finds a good husband has found a blessing. It works both ways. You know, we often give more attention to buying a computer or a car or a piece of clothing than we do to the spouse that we marry. I've seen that maybe more than you do because you know, I'm in the, the type of work where I get to meet a lot of young people or individuals who are about to marry each other. And sometimes I see two people you know, and I say, wow, this is a train wreck. You know, this thing, this is a train wreck that's going to happen here. But then sometimes I see couples, thankfully more times than not, I see couples, wow, what a great combination this is. And if they, you know, if they keep going, they're going to do well. You know? You're so happy for them because they found each other. He's found the right one. She's found the, the right one for one another. And that's so important because every aspect of our lives will be affected by the person that we eventually marry. So to find a partner that loves the Lord first, that is heaven bound, that desires to love us above all others, wow, that's a marvelous blessing. The majority of people, you know, they get married, but they see marriage as the vehicle that will get them the house, the car, the family, so I'm going to get married and then we're going to get a house. You know, they, it's part of the package. And they don't realize that if you don't have, if you don't have it all because you have this particular partner, then adding a car or adding a nicer house or having children will not create happiness or satisfaction within the marriage. It's the marriage that's supposed to give you satisfaction, not the stuff that you buy together. Oh, it'll be great, we'll have two salaries coming in, we'll be able to finally afford that SUV that we want to buy. That's not what creates happiness in marriage. I'm happy because I'm married to that person. No matter what we drive, no matter where we live, no matter where we are, no matter how sick or not sick, the happiness comes because I'm married to you. The person who finds a spouse who sincerely loves the Lord, who is filled with the Spirit, and who is led by the word of God. Oh my, oh my, oh my. This person is the one who has it all. No matter where he or she lives, no matter what he or she drives, what a marvelous gift you have. And then maybe we could say that having it all, and I put this, it could have been first, but I wanted to save it for the third point definitely requires finding the savior of your soul. No matter what you have, there is nothing you can exchange for your soul. You cannot talk your way into heaven. You cannot work your way into heaven. You cannot buy your way into heaven. Regardless of what we have here on earth, before God, we're nothing. We are helpless. We are covered with sin. We are covered with guilt. Isaiah says it in this way. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Isaiah chapter 64, verse six. Isaiah was simply trying to say, look, you cannot stand before God and, and have any righteousness. You cannot be self-righteous 
before God. That's why he says, even the good you do, is, is, they're like dirty rags in front, of, in front of God. That's how lost we are, all of us. Each person needs a savior, whether they know it or not, because all have sinned and all will face the wrath of God. Romans 3.23 and 6.23. So Paul expresses both the plight and the anguish felt by one who recognizes this reality, as well as the joy that one feels when he finds this salvation. When he says in Romans 7.24, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? He's saying what Isaiah is saying, except he's looking at himself. You know, Isaiah is, is, is talking about the human condition. Paul is just looking at himself and he says, well, I'm lost, I'm a lost person. Who can save me from this wretched skin, this wretched body of mine? Who can save me from this? I'm lost. And so in this Verse, he reveals the fear and the pain of a person who is lost and knows that his own sinfulness is the cause of this con condition. And in the next verse or next chapter, in chapter eight, verse one, he confesses his joy at finding his Savior and the salvation that his Savior brings when he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, one. In other words, he's going, whew, <laughs> woo -hoo. I took a look at myself and it wasn't very good. And then I realized, oh, but wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus has saved me, whew, whoa. Dodge that bullet. Later on, Paul explains that salvation by Christ brings the individual all the blessings made available my God. And you might have said, you know, he's talking about things that, you know, where you have it all, and of course he's the preacher, he's got to put in saving my soul. Well, yeah, I do have to put in saving my soul, but there's a very good reason that saving my soul is part of having it all. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 1.3 about having it all. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with, listen, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Paul is saying, if you have Christ, if you have Christ as your Savior, you have every single blessing that God has created and reserved for you in heaven. In other words, if you have Christ as your savior, you have it all as far as the spiritual blessings are concerned. And there are too many of them to list, too many to list. Finding Jesus is finding the jackpot. It's finding the pearl, as the Bible says. And so when you find satisfaction in your work, because your work is pretty much what you do with your whole life. What does everybody say all the time, right? I want to be healthy so that, you know, I want to be able to work and I want to be useful. I don't, I don't want to be sitting around in some sick bed for 10 years. I want to be useful. I don't know how many people have said to me, you know what, I hope that God, you know, I hope that I'm healthy and I can work and I can do what I do and I'm useful to people and so on and so forth and then the Lord will just take me, right? I never heard anybody that ever said, you know, I want to retire when I'm 65, have five good years, and then by the time I'm 70, I want to be in a sick bed till I'm about 95, and then I want to go to heaven. No. I want to be useful, I want to be active, I want to be able to do things, I want to be able, you know, so on and so forth, and then when the time comes for the Lord to get me, just come and get me, Lord. Don't let me drag around down here. And so when you find the ability to be satisfied in what you do, you've pretty much found satisfaction with everything that happens in your earthly life. And when you find a good spouse, you know what you've done? You have found the other piece of your life with which you can share that satisfaction. When you find the right spouse, you have found the person to whom you say, isn't that a beautiful sunset? And she says, yes, praise God for that. If you have that moment with your spouse, 
You've got everything there is to have here on earth. Everything. But when you find Jesus Christ, you have then found the key to heaven and all the treasures therein. If you found Jesus, you've truly got it all. And if you don't, it doesn't matter what you have, it'll never be enough. You know, sermons usually have a point or an objective, and I have a couple of objectives with this particular sermon as I close it out this evening. Number one, I, I want you to strive for the things that truly satisfy you in this life. Joy from your work or your activities and joy in a loving marriage. These, excuse me, there are other things, but these are the ones worth working on. These are the things worth sacrificing for. These are the things being careful with. Be careful with your marriage. Be careful with your work. Don't bump that stuff around. The, the, these things are precious. You know, I once saw the biography of a woman called Christina Onassis. Remember Aristotle Onassis, the billionaire? He was married to Jackie Kennedy for a time. He died and he left his daughter, Christina, a billion dollars. That was her inheritance, a billion dollars. Christina Onassis died when she was 38 years old. She had been married four times. She was addicted to alcohol and barbiturates and she was terribly unhappy by her own admission. She never found happiness. And in watching her story, it became evident that she never found the right man and she never found the right cause. Her money always got in the way. You can have it all in this life if you know what to look for. So one of the objectives of the lessons is to point you in the right direction. It's never too late to be looking for the right things. Secondly, I want you to truly have it all. I want everyone to have it all. And that's not possible without the blessings of heaven provided only through Jesus Christ, the Savior. You know, we can have it all in this world, but only for a short time. Jesus promises all the blessings of heaven. Remember I said too many to enumerate? There are some that I could say. How about power, spiritual power? There's a blessing we'll have in heaven. Purity, joy, peace, sonship, knowledge, just to name a few. And Jesus guarantees these things forever. Imagine, forever. I want you to strive for these things because in the world, a good spouse or a joyful, you know, joyful work, sometimes we lose those things and sometimes those things are interrupted. But the blessings of heaven are for everyone and they're for always. And then finally, I want you to pursue your blessings. I want you to pursue them in the right way. You see, you can have it all, but there are some rules to having it all. And the most important one is the following. You cannot do what is wrong and expect to have the right outcome. It's like computers. If you put junk in, then you're going to get junk out. For example, you can't goof off and neglect training for something or refuse to make an effort, but then end up with a totally satisfying job or vocation. Or you can't ignore your partner or cheat on them and treat them without respect and hope to be happy in your marriage. See what I'm saying? And you can't live without faith and refuse to obey Christ and act in a worldly and immoral way and then expect God to give you all the blessings of heaven. In this sense, you can't have it all. But for those who search for the right things in the right way, God is gracious and kind, and He's eager to bless us with all the blessings of this life and the next life. If that's your case, if you have satisfaction in your life, in other words, you enjoy what you do, you're able to find satisfaction in the small, if that's you, and if you have a partner in life that shares that with you, 
then give thanks and praise God every day for your many blessings. This is the responsibility. Don't feel guilty because you've got it. Be happy that you have it. Give thanks for it. This is how good God is. He gives you something that you will enjoy so that you can have the further joy of praising Him for the good that He's given you. What a, what a God we have. How generous is He. Now for those who may be missing out on these things, of course, that's why we meet. That's why the church is there. If you need prayer or help to strengthen your life here on earth, or if you'd like to secure for yourself the blessings of heaven through faith in Christ, you can take that first step this very evening, confessing His name, repenting of your sins, of course, being buried in the waters of baptism, that's the first step in receiving Christ and the guarantee of all the blessing. So whatever you have, whether it be an opportunity to give thanks or the need to confess Christ, we have gathered here tonight to do that. If you need to come forward, then we do encourage you to do so as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.